Hey everyone, happy Thanksgiving and welcome to Chef AJ Live. Today's a very special day, so much so that I have my family with me, my husband Charles and my little doggy Bailey, because today we have a very, very special show. You know, a lot of people are using today to reflect on what they're thankful for in their life, gratitude, but for some people, this isn't such a great holiday. Maybe they are alone on the holiday or they're dealing with some kind of an illness or they've lost a family member. So Today, I'm bringing you a very inspirational person. You know, when I do this show, I say, I'd like to introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world. Well, I think you'll agree, especially if you watch my show regularly, that of the almost 800 episodes I've done, when you meet today's guest, you will agree that he is amazing. He's not only a motivational speaker, but he's an artist and he's also a quadriplegic. Please welcome our friend to the show, Peter Sovi. It's so good to see you again. You're one of the few things about LA that we actually miss. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff AJ. And Charlie. Hey there, pleasure. Peter. Good to see you. And if, if you're Peter's from our old neighborhood in Sherman Oaks, so it's good to see someone from back home. We used to walk by your apartment every day when we were walking Bailey, and I could see you in the window. Yep. And in fact, sometimes. It would be a little bit dark and I would hear like my name being called from the street and it would scare the bejesus out of me. But then I see <laughs> it was just me. So thanks for coming on, Pete. I, I just feel like your story is, is such an inspiration to so many people. I'm not sure where to start, but you are a quadriplegic like, and you're a C5. What, what does that mean to be a C5? Yeah, so I'm a quadriplegic. When I was 19, I dove into a lake that was too shallow. And I kind of like snapped my head all the way forward and I hit the bottom and I broke my spinal cord at the fifth vertebrae just to give everyone like an idea of what that is. If you lean forward and you feel that little bump in your neck, if you lean your head forward, that is your seventh vertebrae. So when you feel that bump back there, that's your seventh, my injury is too higher than that bump. And so basically, you know, I'm paralyzed from the fifth vertebrae down, which means I can move my arms and I can move my wrist, but I can't like move my fingers per se, but I can move my arm and wrist. How long ago was that? Oh, that was many moons ago. It was actually between my freshman and sophomore year in college back in August of 1987. So, I believe this is 2021. Boy, it was like 34 years ago. Wow. I mean, wow. I mean, wow. So what was it like when you, I mean, did you wake up and then you realized you were paralyzed or how, how did that work? Yeah, you know, it's crazy. I was at this, I was with my, my, one of my best pals, Teddy, and a couple of gals and we we're running down to this man-made lake and I ran ahead of them and kind of stripped down to do some skinny dipping or something and ran in, dove into the lake. And the next thing I know, I was floating face down in the water and I had no idea what happened or why. I didn't know if I was like floating to the middle of the lake, uh, if I was floating at the bottom of the lake. All I knew is like I couldn't breathe. I had to hold my breath. And, um, and then my friends, like as they, recounted the story to me we're like oh you ran ahead of us and by the time we got down the hill you were floating in the water but we kind of thought you were doing dead man's float but then after another minute it was like why is he still just floating there and finally my friend teddy got into the water and pulled me out and they said it was like two or three minutes and so like for me under the water all i could focus on was holding my breath wow it was actually a dual conversation in my head there was one part of my head that was like, I need to breathe so bad, trying to convince myself to breathe. So one part of me was like, I could, I could just take a quick breath, catch my breath really quick before water comes in. I just need to catch a breath. And the other part of me is like, no, if you take a breath, water will come in and you will drown. And the other part of me is like, no, I swear, I'll take a really quick breath before the water comes in it's like no you can't take a breath and it was like this dual voice in my head that was just like you got to keep holding your breath like no i need a quick breath no hold your breath and luckily as that debate was going on i was holding my breath until my friend teddy pulled me out of the water and then he kind of pulled me to the shore and i was like 
I think I'm paralyzed. I can't feel anything. And, wow. And it, it happened that quick. Did, did it hurt when you hit your head or did you become paralyzed immediately? I mean, it was immediate paralysis and I don't remember pain, but I remember the girls ran up to the house. This was before cell phones. Mm -hmm. They called the police. I just remember lying there and then hearing sirens. And I remember like fire trucks and police. I remember a policewoman coming down and using her badge to like poke me to see where I could feel. And as that was happening, I went into shock. And that's the last thing I remember for like a week or two weeks. Oh, gee. People, my friends and my mother tell me that when I got to the hospital, that I was complaining about how bad my neck hurt. But I don't remember any of that. Wow. Wow. So when you like did you wake up and then the doctor gave you the news what was that like as a I'm imagining a, a teenager yeah I mean it was very difficult I was you know very active I was playing baseball I was a very active person I had my own business at the time you know I was DJing playing baseball had my own business going to college and you know my mother my father just passed away like a year and a half before that my mother was just kind of getting back on her feet again I always feel bad because it's like, you know, she's she kind of gets over losing her husband and then her son goes and does this. But um, yeah, it's like when I kind of like started coming to a week or so later, I, I was in and out. Like they had me on morphine, I think. So I was in and out having some hallucinations. But when I was very lucid and the doctor had the conversation with me, it's interesting because my mother recounting the story to me tells me the first thing I asked the doctor wasn't will I be able to walk again it was will I be able to have a family still which I find very interesting all these years later even but um you know at first it's one of those things it's like hard to hear that you're going to basically be in a wheelchair the rest of your life and you know they said at the time your injury is so high you're probably going to need an electric chair maybe even a sip and puff chair and it's so much to comprehend because I had no idea of what paralysis meant before that. Like my only concept of paralysis was this after school special where a kid was playing basketball and like was going for a layup and fell on his butt. And the next day he was in a wheelchair playing wheelchair basketball. Like you don't realize that it takes like, you know, a year of rehabilitation and just to get, you know, back to a somewhat normal life. But, um, you know, it was hard to hear on one point, but on the other hand, you know, I had a great support system of tons of friends around me and my mother was always like a rock in my life. And for me, like my defining moment in my mind and memory was a few weeks into it, as I just laid in the bed at night, I was on this striker bed that kind of like it's attached to your skull with wires and stuff and the bed goes back and forth so you don't get pressure sores and they had already fused they did a surgery where they took a piece of my bone a, a chip of bone from my hip and wired it to the spinal cord to stabilize and then put this halo brace on me which is like a metal ring around your head that screws into your skull and then has wires attached to a vest so that you can't move it all and as I'm lying in this bed, not moving, going back and forth, one night, I just remember having this conversation with myself. And it was kind of like, okay, Peter, a really bad thing happened. And you don't know what the future is going to be like. You don't know what it means, but you know, you're, you always thrive for the best. So it's like, I made a deal with myself. I said, Peter, Promise yourself right here and now that you're not going to look back in anger. You're not going to look back in frustration. You're not going to look back in depression. You're not going to look back and keep saying, what if I didn't dive into the lake? It happened. And now I'm going to promise myself from this night forward to always look ahead. And that's like that conversation with myself is what's always motivated me. Like, that I promised myself I will always look forward. I will always, I will always strive to thrive and not just survive. Like to me, surviving day to day is not enough. You have to like 
do something above and beyond to thrive and not just survive. And I've just always kept that in mind my whole life. And I think, you know, now 34 years later, I still go back to that. Like I just think about it, just always look forward, always look forward, never look behind, never say what if, don't get caught in any sort of depression or anger. It's not worth an ounce of your energy. And that's, that's yeah, that's that's why I remember uh, uh, Peter reading that on a Facebook post. I think you did. It was August of last year, and you you um, told that story. I, I I thought that was especially moving. It was such a defining moment, you know, such a big pivotal moment when I think most people would would not not pick the uh, the choice you did. You know, most people would be really kind of looking on the on the dark side of it all. Yeah, I definitely came across some, you know, there were some dark days that first year in rehab and stuff. Like I actually witnessed a fellow quadriplegic going to rehab commit suicide. He was like bedridden for the longest time and he finally got into an electric wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he did was drive his wheelchair into the swimming pool and drown himself to death. Wow. Oh my God. Wow. And then there was another guy in the room across from me that he got out of the hospital like maybe a couple months while I was still in there for quite a while. And I got news that he he was a paraplegic, but he shot himself and died. Wow. Like really strange to, you are surrounded by a lot of depression. And there's even like a guy in my room that he came from a big Italian family and they just and he was a quadriplegic as well. And they just like swarmed him, you know, with family love, which is great, but they did everything for him. And one thing I'll also never forget about my mother, rest in peace, she passed away like in 2012. But I, after I was out of rehab and the hospitals after about nine months, I went back and lived at home with her for about a year. And she told me the hardest thing for her during that year was watching me struggle to do things. And, but she said, I always did it because I knew that was the only way you would become more independent. She's like, trust me, I wanted to come in and do everything for you. But I knew that you wouldn't get independent and grow without figuring out how to do things. And I'll be forever grateful to her for that because so many other quadriplegics that I met, their families just came in and would do everything for them. And I don't know if they ever learned how to become independent to the best of their ability. Like there's still tons of things I need other people to help me with. But for a high level quadriplegic, I feel that I gained a lot more independence for myself by figuring out ways to do things to the to the best of my physical capabilities. And that being said, there's lots of other quadriplegics out there that are incredibly independent and do amazing things. Do they offer any kind of like psychological support to you to when, when something like this happens or was it just your innate attitude that caused you to be able to thrive? Well, you know, back then in those nine months that I was in the hospitals and rehab, they did have like, you know, a social worker and they did have a counselor and to be honest, I don't remember too many sessions with the counselor. And I even want to say, you know, like, my parents were like old school. You know, like, my parents were the kind of things like, oh, psychiatrists, therapists, that's all quackery. And you know, <laughs> therapy was not, you know, mental therapy was not a thing. And I kind of think that I probably adapted a little bit of that attitude. So I'm sure that I want to say that I even like refused to meet with counselors that much but so on one hand I'm sure that they were helpful to me but I really I know that I just counted on myself a lot and I was really fortunate to just have a great attitude I was always very positive I was always very motivated and that really did carry over to being injured just like how can I keep that level of positivity and motivation, even though I have this incredible hardship in life now? Yeah. How, how hard is it? Like, I mean, tell me like what your life is like on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, um, 
That's a good question, AJ. You know, first of all, I have to hire people. Like I'm not fully independent, so I hire people. I need help every morning to get out of bed and I need help every night to get into bed. So first of all, you know, my life is, you know, I'm dependent on other people every single day of my life. Like there's no vacation. Like I would love to have a weekend where I'm like, you know what? I need a weekend away from people and I just want to be <laughs> yeah. uh, it can't happen. I can't get out of bed without help. So, you know, my day starts with, you know, someone coming in the morning and they help me get from my bed to a shower chair and from the shower chair into the shower. And, you know, I could partly help myself take a shower, but then I need help, like, you know, washing and rinsing my feet and legs and, you know, bottom and back that I can't reach. And then, they help me get back to the bed and help me get dressed and then into my wheelchair for the day. And it takes time, you know, and I mean, just for me between waking up and getting in my wheelchair to start the day, you know, you're talking two or three hours and it's, it, it is frustrating because there's some days where you just want to roll out of bed and get your day started. <laughs> yeah. I realize that even some of my friends, like when I tell them like, Hey, listen, I can't talk or do anything till 11 a.m. or something. They'll be like, oh, it must be nice to sleep in. It's like, well, no, I'm really, I'm getting up at 7.30 or 8 o'clock, but that's just how long it takes me, you know? And sometimes I think it's hard for people to understand that, but, you know, whatever. I, I do the best with what I got. And then luckily at night, it doesn't take a long time for help. And I just incorporate my roommate into being my night helper to kind of get undressed and go from my wheelchair to bed. But I would say that's like the biggest hardship of life is just that you are 100% dependent on other people. But I've had great caregivers that stay with me for years at a time. And so I'm very lucky there. And once I'm up in my chair, I can kind of fend for myself for most of the day. You know, I get food set up that I can heat up later in the microwave and I make sure I have waters all around because I would say the other hardship of being, you know, paralyzed is your biggest hurdles are your bowel and bladders. Not to be like too whatever, you know, but especially my bladder because it's a muscle and I can't, I don't want to get too, you know, personal or gross or anything, but I can't just, when you get the urge to urinate, you go to the bathroom and urinate. For me, my bladder I basically have a tube attached from my bladder to a bag on my leg that's constantly emptying my bladder. But there's constantly urine in my bladder. So you're constantly fighting infection. So it's like, I just have to be conscious to drink tons of water every day to hopefully avoid bladder infections, but I still get three to four to five a year. And you know, it's just a worry. The older I get, the more antibiotics might not help you. So now the older I get, the more and more water I drink and it's really helping me out, you know? Well, one of your caregivers or former caregivers and fans are watching Ninja Nikki. He says, hello. Ah, uh -huh. uh, yes. Ninja. You know Nick. Nick is, that's, he's actually Chef T or, or no, Ninja Nikki, I'm sorry. He's like, real tall. Yeah, no, I'm getting him confused with the other yeah, chef, that friend of yours. But yeah. Nikki is a chef, yep. Ninja, Ninja Nikki is also a fellow vegan like you guys. And he's a great guy because I actually met him. He was working at the local Trader Joe's. They used to be next door to your boat. Oh, we used to go to that Trader Joe's all the time. Sure, yeah. you know it. I became friends with him just as like the guy at Trader Joe's that was always helping me reach stuff. And at one point in time, I was like, hey, I need like a backup caregiver to help me at night from my wheelchair to bed. And, you know, he kind of became that person to me. And then, of course, you know, we just became great friends. And he actually opened up his own juicery all the way over in Chino. And, you know, we haven't been in touch greatly the last couple of years, but I think it's going really great for him. And yeah, he's like right in your line of being a vegan chef and you know, bringing positivity and health conscious living to the world. Yep. Well, he's been on the show before, actually. Well, speaking of positivity, you are a motivational speaker. You, I believe you give presentations at Children's Hospital. Yeah, you know, um, 
I, I've been really fortunate to, for a long time, when I moved to LA, after my accident was in 87, I was in the middle of freshman and sophomore year at community college. So I skipped one year, went back to community college, finished my sophomore year, transferred to University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign for my junior and senior year. And then after graduation, I packed my van and moved to Los Angeles, not knowing I wanted to be in the entertainment industry, just knowing I wanted to go where it was warm because in the wheelchair, taking the snow and ice and wind was just too much. But I just bring up this backstory because after I moved to LA in August of 91, I immediately got involved with a group that we spoke in high schools and middle schools to students just bringing disability awareness to them. And I did that for like about 20 years and I really loved it. And after I became, you know, I don't wanna get into the mouth painting already, but I, I became a mouth painter. And that kind of opened up another new world to where, you know, I can now go around doing some motivational speeches to organizations, the schools, the art classes, and I've been to a few children's hospitals just to, you know, God love them, young children that are going through so much. And it's been so great. Like I'll come in and kind of like speak to them a little bit about my story, but then I'll show them how I mouth paint and we'll bring in canvases and brushes for them. And even though they've got their hands and everything, they love to try and mouth paint themselves. And it's just like such a fun afternoon of like, you know, spending it with these kids that are that are going through such tremendous things like cancer and, and they just kind of get to take their minds off things for a while and have fun trying to paint with their teeth like me and stuff. And that's been such a blessing and a good time because I really feel that as a person that, you know, that I have this hardship in life, to me, it's not something that you dwell, you bury your head in a hole and you know, I've, I've probably said it too much already and get depressed or whatever. To me, it's like, I now have an obligation to the world to inspire and motivate them. And I don't say that egotistically. I say it like truly and sincerely that I'm someone with major obstacles and hardships in my life. And I want to overcome those and thrive. And I feel the honor and obligation to motivate other people in a non-egotistical way, just in a way of like saying like, hey, like watch me try to overcome my obstacles. What obstacles can you overcome? Let's do it together. Let's make this a happy world. I think you need a TED talk. <laughs> hey Pete, Gina says she loves the painting behind you. Is that one that you painted? Uh, well, the big painting, no. But there's little paintings like right these little paintings are all my paintings. We'll get a chance to see them, right? Yeah, and the, the big painting is more something just, you know, that I just like as a colorful piece of art. Because this is like, behind me is like my little kind of like painting quarters of my living room. It's my little tiny art space where I do all my paintings and create. Because as of 2015, I after, you know, spending my life like, producing and writing. I was fortunate enough to get into the MFPA, the Mouth and Feet Painting Artists, and become a mouth painter. And so now like I get to paint and write and live the life of an artist. Did you ever paint before? Before painting with your mouth? Did you ever have any artistic inclination or ability? Yeah, you know what's interesting about that is like I've always been a very artistic and creative person. But the only painting I really ever did was in an art class in the high school way back in like 85, 86. I did like just a couple of like paintings as part of like many different art projects, but that was it. But then in 2015 through Facebook, I met this other very inspirational quadriplegic and incredible woman, Miriam Paré, and she's a mouth painter. And when we first met, through Facebook, I just thought that she was an incredible painter and that's that was her deal, but we became Zoom buddies or Skype buddies at the time. And one day she told me like, 
I was asking her like, what's the deal with your mouth painting? She's like, oh, I belong to this organization, the MFPA. And they're like a worldwide global organization based in Switzerland, but they have offices in America and China and South America and Mexico and all over the place. And they, they're basically a publishing house that do a lot of like Christmas cards and things and spring motifs. And they basically once a year accept applications and they take about five new artists a year and they have about 800 artists worldwide. And she's like, hey, you're really creative. Have you ever painted? I was like, oh no, but you know, I did a couple of paintings in high school and I'm, I feel very artistic. Like when I would actually direct projects I would do all my storyboards by putting a pencil in my teeth and drawing the storyboards. And my DPs always said like, wow, your drawings are kind of rudimentary, but they're really cool. You can almost frame uh -huh. them hard <laughs> themselves. And so like, um, she's like, you should apply for the organization. I'm like, you know, I don't know. And, and she's like, you know, when you apply for them, it helps to show them that you had painting aspirations before your injury. I was like, well, hey, listen, I am really good Facebook friends with one of my old teachers from high school. And I bet you he would write a letter saying that I was a really creative and artistic person. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna think about it. So I'm not even kidding now. Two hours later, there's a knock on my door, it's UPS, and they hand me a poster tube. And I open it up and it's from that very same teacher in high school. And it's a piece of my art that I did in high school that he's had hanging on his office. <laughs> all, yeah, all this time? And he was like, well, I retired a thing out my office and I still had your art on my wall. And he's like, I didn't want to get rid of it. So I decided to ship it to you. And it came on that day, two hours after that conversation, I was like, if this isn't a sign from the universe, but it, then, and so, yeah, so I did the application. You had to do like six paintings and write this long essay. And long story short, I got into the organization in January of 2016 and I've been a member ever since. And they, um, they commissioned me to do, I created my first painting was a painting of my cat Muffin. And they wanted, they loved the cat character so much that they commissioned me to do a children's Christmas book based on the Muffin characters. So we did Muffin's Fun and Curious Christmas. And just a couple of months ago, they commissioned me to do a second Muffin children's book that's gonna be Muffin Traveling the World. Can people buy the book? The Muffin's Fun and Curious Christmas, they can buy it. It's only available on the mfpausa.com website. So if you go to that website and look under books, you'll see Muffins Fun and Curious Christmas. So that's mfpausa.com, like mouth, feet, painting, artists, usa.com. Once you got accepted, did you just start painting or did they give you some guidance? Because I mean, I've taken art classes with my hands and I'm not very good. <laughs> Well, the one thing is when I created my first six paintings as part of my application, it was like a style immediately emerged. Like I didn't know what my style was, but I know as far as like art that's been visually exciting to me my whole life is I've always loved Andy Warhol. I've loved Roy Lichtenstein. And my style was very much inspired, I think by a combination of them, just by doing kind of like pop art sort of things and also very bright colors and very cartoony kind of like Roy Lichtenstein became my immediately my immediate style and actually the MFPA when they accepted me they said that they actually liked the fact that I was very different than a lot of their painters a lot of their painters would do do like still lives or portraits or very realistic looking paintings and mine are very absurd cartoony they generally have like a sense of humor to each painting. And, you know, that's what they kind of liked about me is that I was very different in that regard. So you've got your own style then. Yeah. Well, that's good. Wow. They don't, they don't take very many people in that program, uh, do they? No, like literally maybe five a year and we're talking around the whole world. Wow. And I think they must get like probably, you know, a hundred applications a year or so. So it's a very exclusive publishing house to be a part of. And they literally, you know, compensate you monthly for painting, you know? So it's like, it's very fortunate to be able to have like an amazing hobby like painting and to get, you know, paid.
to do a great hobby. That is incredible. You also, at least I think before the pandemic, didn't you do a lot of volunteer work? Yes. Yeah. Like, you know, that's always kind of been a deal for me in my life and stuff is that, you know, it's always important for me to give back to people. It's, it's almost, it's like, I don't know how to say without saying egotistical or something, but it's like in my blood to just like, like I want to give and share. Like I even remember being really young, you know, my dad worked six days a week in a factory and my mother was like a blue collar, you know, even though she was a blue collar mother, she had a job where they delivered cables to home and she like soldered and, you know, did all this like wire work at home for a living. And, uh -huh. but yet they would always, take the time on holidays they would bring us to like we would go to senior citizen homes with homemade cookies and just bring joy to these old older people and and you know so I really credit them for showing me way back then like you know you're when your free time is so precious you still take your free time to go out and bring joy to other people and that stayed with me my whole life and so yeah you know like besides just like speaking to people and trying to motivate people. Um, you know, like a big thing, I've been studying the ancient wisdom of Kabbalah for, you know, like over 10 years. And as of 2015 or so, I had the, the good fortune of becoming a mentor. So you'd mentor new students to the wisdom and get to kind of walk hand in hand with them along their journey in life that always like is so, brings back so much inspiration to me and stuff like that. and um yeah i don't know just being a part of the community and being able to volunteer whenever i can actually brings me incredible joy in my life is there anything in the ancient wisdom of kabbalah that talks about why you had the accident yeah you know there's actually like i think lots of without getting too deep into things and stuff like that the ancient wisdom of kabbalah definitely talks about like, you know, past lives and reincarnation and all that stuff. And the, I think one of the best kind of things I've heard is one of my teachers, when I first started studying back in 2010, took me aside after a class and he was like, kind of like, hey, Peter, I want to talk to you for a second. I was like, hey, what's up? And he was like, do you know, you know, your opportunity in life? I was like, what is my opportunity in life? He's like, you know, you've been given the chance to like bring so much light into the world and so much light into people's lives. And he's like, to me, now that I'm getting to know you, he's like, you know, you're, this happened to you because your soul was meant to bring light and love and motivation into people's life, which I already kind of knew on a level, but just to kind of here you get affirmed on like the universe life meaning of life level was really mind-blowing to me have you ever you, before you decided to not think about what if did, did you ever say why me you know yeah i've i've contemplated why me and i think that it just keeps going back to the same thing like i think it was like I know I was a very strong, motivated person before my accident. And I just keep thinking that it's like, I, this happened to me because I had the strength to persevere and motivate people from it. You know, other people might not have that same strength and their answer of why me could be totally different. But my answer of why me was that, that this happened to me because I had the strength to persevere and to motivate people. I just love that. Hey, do you think you could show us some of your art or maybe even show us how one paints with their mouth? Yes. Yeah, I definitely can give a little demonstration of things and kind of like uh, how I go through how I go through the process. So actually, we'll start with I've got my roommate Will here to help me. If you could take the camera off, here's Will. I will. I will. Will, if you take the camera off for a second, you could still see me. So now, basically, like in the spirit of mouth painting, I also use a stylus 
with my teeth. And right now I'm gonna kind of put it in my hand. Like I can't do fine lines with the stylus in my hand, but I could do like pecking. But what I do first is I actually draw on my iPad like a sketch. So right now this is like, I haven't done a background or anything like this, but this is a new painting I've sketched out that I'm calling Velociraptor Vegan. <laughs> <laughs> honor of the show, but so basically I'll go from that and then I'll take it down to a kind of like a line art thing. And then, Will, can you press number one on that red remote? And so then from that, from that point in time, okay, let me get turned around here. Zoom a little closer, here, right? Actually, will it reach you, Smart? Um, it will probably. Give me one second, ladies and gentlemen. Just just a moment here. Okay, you're making us dizzy, Will. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, so. That's okay. Sorry, right, guys. Here we go. So from here, I'm doing my I'm doing my best to watch the screen and you. So. <laughs> So from here, you can see I've like now I've kind of traced my drawing out of the canvas. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. So what I'll do now is I'm just going to give like a really quick little rundown. The first thing that I do is I've got paint markers and see, and like I'm really giving you like the process, like. To do all of this like without great use of your hands is difficult. So I, and, I and you really only have partial use of one of your hands. Is that correct? Yeah, the right hand I can't use at all. So I do a lot with my teeth to the point where I actually had to get my top four teeth and bottom three teeth crowned because I wore them down to the nerves. Wow. Do dentists ever have suggestions for that? Because I'm sure that other yeah. Just have the same situation. The dentist's suggestion is don't use your teeth. Oh, <laughs> well, they always say teeth are, are jewels, not tools. Yep. You know, I'm actually going to come around the other way so that the light is a little better. So give me one second here. I think that will make it a little easier to see what he's doing. So basically, I'll start with this, like, as you can see, we have an avocado, a tomato, a lettuce, and a cucumber. And the first thing I'll do is start outlining. I think it's great, Peter, that you can talk while you're doing that too. To an extent. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is really something. Were you left-handed or right-handed before your accident? Well, that's a great question because as you see, I'm doing everything with my left hand. Yeah. I was right-handed. Figures, um, huh? I had to learn to do everything with my right, with my left hand. To the point where now 34 years later, I feel left-handed. Sure, you're a lefty now. But in my mind, I still sometimes kind of like envision doing things right-handed, like throwing footballs and baseballs and all of that. But just everything else is so natural left-handed now, it's crazy. So now, using my teeth again, I have to open up painting. Actually, part of the longest part of this process is actually doing the getting paints on and off pellets. But I kind of wanted to show the realism of it. So basically like an 11 by 14 painting like this will take me about 14 to 15 hours. Wow. So now, so now you sketch it first and then you uh, fill in the details next. Yeah, I, I create the concept on the iPad. And then I do a line sketch on the iPad and then transfer the line sketch to the canvas and then do black outline and everything on the canvas. Then 
fill in all my colors on the canvas, then redo a black outline on the canvas. And that whole process from iPad to canvas is 15 to 18 hours. That's a lot of time. Yeah, I just got paint out. And then I'm just yeah. going to show you just a really quick how I actually paint and then we'll get back to it. So I figure out the brush I want to use. As you can see, like, I don't know if you can see all my brushes have bite marks all over them. Sir. Now I need to get the painting in the water. Even though like right now, you see I'm using my hand with the paintbrush, but there's no like, I would never be able to paint with this. It's like all willy nilly. But it's amazing. With my teeth, I can be extraordinarily accurate. Now, are those paints, are those watercolors or? They're acrylics. Acrylics, okay. I like acrylics because they dry really fast. Uh-huh. Whereas oils do not. Mm. Well, there, that's a good close up. Good, good uh, work by the cameraman. I'm not here. Let's hear it. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, that gives you an idea. And then I would come in further and do like lighter green on top of it. Uh -huh. At the end of the day, do more thicker black outline around it. And then, you know, that's how I would do each piece of the vegetables. And that's how I would do the raptor. And I'm still kind of deciding what to do for the background. But, you know, that gives you a quick idea of what it's like for me to mount paint. I'd love to see. Do you have any pieces of your finished art at your house? Actually, I do. Coming, coming. There is. Right here, I, I, we're looking at this is a this is a painting called "You Deserve a Slow Clap." <laughs> I, I love like the it. colors. Actually, this one like best showcases my inspiration of Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein combined. You know, with the kind of repetitive pop art culture of it and the bright color, cartoony aspect of Roy Lichtenstein. Yeah, I I love Roy Lichtenstein. Is everybody loves an ugly Christmas sweater with muffin sitting inside. An <laughs> and that one is featured in the Christmas book, Muffins, Fun, and Curious Christmas. And then the third one here, I actually did this third painting before I ever saw Up, the Pixar film. But it's just Muffin floating with some balloons. That muffin is getting pretty well known here. Yeah, she is. So, you know, that's a sample of some of my finished work. It's so nice. incredible. Jesse wants to know how long can you comfortably work painting with your mouth? That is a good question. I'm going to go ahead and let's turn everything back around here. You can still hear me okay, right? Yep. Um, you know, when I say that a painting takes, the painting itself takes about 14 hours and with creating it on the iPad, um, you know, like, you know, maybe add another three hours for inspiration, sketching, all that sort of thing. But as far as the painting goes, I would say after about eight hours, my neck is kind of like, okay, that's about it. I know when I've had like kind of serious painting deadlines that um, I've had to go even longer, but 
you know, I've actually got a really strong neck because my neck is actually like my strongest muscle. So my whole life has just been really building up my neck muscle. But I mean, it does get really, really sore and tired, but I can, I can go eight hours. You know what, Pete, there's like a green light on your forehead, almost like somebody just put a hit on you. I, 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 I don't think know it's if you a, see I think it. it's probably the sunlight coming in. in your room, maybe I it. Or it might be the light behind me. It is, yeah. Here. Oh, you, okay. Maybe that's it. Quite. Do you do, you do any go. type of exercise, Pete? And, you know, I don't see you guys on the screen anymore. Are you oh, still okay. I'll, I'll put our back. I, there you go. We're back. How's that? Uh -oh. You were showcasing me. I get it. Yep. Do, can you exercise at all in any way? You know what? Like after the first few years of my injury, I did a lot of exercise. And in college, I was on my wheelchair rugby, quad rugby team. So I worked out all the time. And it was actually a varsity letter sport. I got a varsity jacket in college playing quad rugby. But... When I moved out to California, I kind of said to myself, you know, you have a choice that you could live a life where you're like kind of rehabbing all the time and strengthening, you're going to the gym, which is time consuming. But I said, you know, like, I just want to live my life as like normal as possible and start working and living life. So I would say for me, the biggest thing as a high level quadriplegic was insisting on pushing myself my entire life in a manual chair instead of using a power chair. Like it, I'm not saying anything against other quadruplegics. They use a power chair because it makes your life so much easier. But for me, I chose like the really tough path of pushing myself in a manual chair. And I think it kept me in good shape and made my muscles as strong as possibly could be for my entire life. And to be honest, like in the last like 15, 20 years, I've never done any outside exercise. Wow. Just okay. pushing myself on a daily basis. Susanna says, when you paint, do you paint in the quiet or do you like to listen to music or podcasts? Oh no, music all the way. Like, uh -huh. like I gotta have music when I paint and my go-to music is usually I'll say, you know, I'll ask my, I'll call it my Alex unit right now so I don't activate her. I will say oh. I'll either do a yacht rock music mix or I'll ask for Barry Manilow radio or Little River Band radio. <laughs> okay. That smooth music from the 70s while I'm painting and that's my jam, baby. Wow. So Pete, what's your biggest challenge right now that you're facing? Huh, let's see. You know, one thing I was also going to bring up as far as exercise goes is... Um, the other thing that's kept me strong all these years besides coaching is that I've also been fortunate enough to drive. I've got a cargo van that I drive. It takes actually a lot of strength to like turn the steering wheel and do the brakes. And that's helped keep me in shape. But I bring that up not only because driving is something that takes strength and effort and gives me great independence, ties right in with your question of what's one of my greatest obstacles right now is that unfortunately about a year ago now you know thankfully it happened during a pandemic when there was nowhere to go but my van I had a, just a minor accident with the van but it basically cracked the engine block and the front axle in the van is totaled and so the my wheelchair I drove a 40 ton line cargo van with adaptations and anyway it's now gone to van heaven and so after having you know i've been driving since 1989 and i feel so fortunate that i've had these 33 i say 33 years because now i've not had my van for a year but you know i had 33 years of driving around with full independence of where i go and where i stop to now kind of being like you know not having a van and being independent. I would say it's the toughest thing, especially now that I know we're still more, we're still deep into this pandemic than anyone hoped we would be at this point in time. But things are opening up, you know, and I want to get out there and be mentoring again and, you know, speaking to people again and stuff like that. And it's hard without my van, you know, you got to really figure things out. 
you know, we want that for you too. And we thought of a way that we could help. But before I tell you that way, I just want to share my screen for a minute and play this uh, one minute video for the live audience. Okay. Hey, this is our friend, Peter. He's a painter, a mentor, motivational speaker for schools and a proud cat dad. Even though Peter is disabled and you would think he needs all the help in the world, he is always the first to be there and help everybody else. One of our friends had just met Peter and needed somebody to drive her four hours each way to see her ailing father. Peter's response was, let's go. As a high level quadriplegic, Peter used a highly specialized van to drive around. It opened up the world to him and enabled him to be out and about speaking, mentoring, and inspiring people. But two months ago, Peter got into an accident and the van he had been using for 21 years became undrivable. With all the needed adaptations, a new van is going to cost upwards of $80,000. Peter at this point does not have enough funds even for a down payment. Even if you don't know Peter, trust us, the world is a better place with him out and about, touching hearts and inspiring people. Please donate to help Peter regain his independence and fulfill his mission. So, wow, you guys got your hands on that video. Nice work. Yeah, yeah. so, so, uh, I got, where's my, uh, thing? so Pete, about a month ago, you know, I don't do a lot of social media, but about a month ago, I woke up in the middle of the night thinking, I wonder how Pete Sobe is. And so I went to your Facebook page. Girl neighbor like, Sobe. What? what? Girl neighbor Pete Sobe. Right, because yeah. I like, I have like 10 <laughs> friends. I don't really do Facebook. And I saw that there was a GoFundMe campaign that was started about a, a year ago and that you'd only reached the halfway point. And Charles and I wanted to help. And what we decided to do with your permission is we created an Indiegogo campaign because we thought that if we could donate all the products that we sell on our website virtually as perks, that maybe people, instead of buying our eBooks and courses from the website, would just buy that through the Indiegogo so that if we could raise $40,000, that would complete what you need to get the van so that you could be independent again. Chef AJ, I'm flabbergasted. Oh my God. That, I mean, it's seriously so nice of you guys. What? Well, it's not up to me. I mean, hoping that people will share this campaign. And, you know, I have 140,000 followers on YouTube. If, if only 400 were to donate at the $97 level or 1600 at the $25 level, you'd have a van by January. And guys, I'd like you to check out the campaign because what we're doing is if you donate at the $97 level, you get what I call the whole kit and caboodle, meaning every single perk that goes below that you'll get. So we're giving you know, exclusive footage from our conferences that we sell for $97. You can get my entire season of Healthy Living with Chef AJ. It's a 13 episode television show that is not available anymore on television or anywhere online with a brand new ebook. So guys, check out the perks. So yeah, the ebook we made is, it has all the recipes from all 13 episodes. And so we haven't released that before. So that's something that you could kind of go through as you watch the episodes. And then there were, um, I think you were going to talk about your other uh, ebook, her dessert ebook. And AJ was really well known in Los Angeles for doing desserts. Um, she was a pastry chef there for a number of years and at, um, in a restaurant. And so, yeah, we, we just kind of put together all these things. And um, Pete's wow. friends had put together the, a, a really great um, uh, uh, crowdsourcing fund. And they have, they raised like, they they've gotten us half the way there. I mean, Pete's yeah, half the way there. I do want to say about that. I do want to take yeah. the opportunity even before, thank you profusely for doing this Indiegogo. I do want to thank all of my friends over the past year that have like, you know, raised half of the money, $45,000 yeah. to date. My friend, Chef T, Tyler, who biked across the country from Santa Monica Pier to Chicago Navy Pier, how many miles is that? That was an incredible uh, ride. It must have been on his bicycle. 2,400 miles over 55 days. Wow. Yeah, but I, I saw people were donating like um, based on, on his on his uh, travel on the bicycle across the country. So yeah, there's just been, people have been doing a lot. Um, My dear friend, Len, who's a former district attorney in Washington, D.C., he's got a huge following on Twitter. He tweeted it and that got a ton of donations. So uh -huh. I do want to thank all of the people, the friends, my new friends that have donated to get me this far. And I'm just flabbergasted about what you're doing and that you're giving away, you know, you're offering your products 
to help raise money for me. That's amazing. And actually now that, you know, I started doing this drawing and painting of the Velociraptor vegan, just kind of in honor of you, Chef AJ, being like one of the preeminent vegan chefs in the country. I'm thinking, you know, if you guys will allow it, if we can do, maybe we could set up a tier where when I finish that painting, that we could, that painting will be one of the offers on the Indiegogo. Oh my God, sure, that, that would be amazing. We can amazing. always yeah. add it. Yeah, we can uh, add, we can add a, a custom painting or any of your paintings. That would be so yeah. cool. Actually, yeah. I mean, that spirit, like I could, I'm probably going to throw in a couple that like maybe the balloon painting and the hands painting we showed. <gasps> oh, I would bid on that. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> you know, I'll tell you that actually the special thing about that is that as a member of the MFPA, the Mouth and Feet Painting Artist, they actually own every single thing I paint because I'm one of their hired painters. So like, you know, they own the license on everything I paint. These paintings that I showed you and the, the physical art that I have basically stays in Switzerland for three years. And every three years they ship me back my original paintings, but they still own the license, but I'm allowed to do whatever I like with the physical paintings. So I only bring this up because by offering these two or three physical paintings, like nobody has ever owned an original Peter Sobey painting, like ever. Wow. And this is a <laughs> new thing. And well, I would bid on it. You'll have to tell us like what, what you want us to start at because our highest level is $97 because we felt if we kept it low, we'd get more people. Yeah. Well, also, also, also our products are all um, digital, meaning that they're emailed to you. So we don't, I mean, we're not doing physical things. So like we have um, online programs. And so what you get is you get access to an online to watch online videos, or you get an ebook, which of course comes electronically. So we're not doing the, the mailing. So, so Pete's of course would be much higher value because it's original art where there's just one of it. And not only that, but it's, it's a, it's a physical thing. It's not and something that goes flying around by email. So that's would be in the higher, whatever yeah, the higher I'll, levels are. I'll obviously ship it to them, but I think also, you know, what would be cool. I'm thinking about this Lost Raptor vegan painting I'm creating in honor of, of Chef AJ. I think I could even offer another level that's higher. You know, I, I just had the idea and when I said, it's like pretty, this is the first chance anyone's ever had to own a Peter Sobey painting. I'll go a step further. We'll have to figure out the price level, but I would like to offer an original painting. So someone that gets this ultimate level, it's only gonna be one person and knowing that between conception and painting, you're looking at about 20 hours of work. I want someone to be able to say they'll buy it. It's just gonna be one person. They'll give me a photo or a concept or an idea and I'm gonna paint it in my style. So they'll get an original Peter Sobe painting of their choosing, like not one that's done already. They, they get to choose the whole concept. Well, Gina is saying, can we commission a painting from him? But I, I mean, I think if the price is right, I mean, I'm thinking you gotta start at a, at least a thousand dollars for that. Uh, maybe double that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, oh, I'm the... sorry. I didn't mean to lowball it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, I just look at like, you know, something that's like, now, of course, the value is coming back to me in my van. But when I think about creating something originally from scratch for 20 hours of work, if I just, you know, even put, you know, a price of, I can't do math very well, if, if it was like, you know, $50 an hour at 20 hours, what is that? $2,000, right? I don't know. <laughs> No, 50 times 20 is a thousand. That's what, that's what I was thinking is $50 maybe. an hour. Sir. That, that sounds worth it to me then. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll get those added, but in the meantime, people are asking if they can donate without taking a perk. Sure you can, or you could just donate yeah. and we'll send somebody yeah. else the perk. So, um, so we, yeah, we just, we just made it live about maybe an hour or so before we went on. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, whole, it's brand new. Wouldn't it have been something if Pete says, 
I wish you hadn't done that. Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> It'd be a whole different show. I would have taken a left turn here. It's like, yeah, what you started an Indiegogo? This interview yeah. over. I'm out of yeah, here. I'm out of here. <laughs> this this stinks. Well, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. We're going to even make a vision board because we really want to manifest this. Even if I have to buy all the levels myself, we want you to have that van. This campaign is 45 days by I think it's something like January 5th yeah, or January something. 9th. So, then. but 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 yeah, we we know that you have a lot to do and you've always been very busy. Um, uh, Peter and I, we have we had a mutual friend Todd who since passed away, and so when I'd be over, over visiting Todd, Peter would come home and he'd be working, and we could tell that he had had a full day and I think he stopped off in the store to get groceries on the way home. So we know that you've, you know, you have a lot to do and you've done a lot and you want to do a lot just like anybody else. So I think this fan would just be a great, a great thing to just give you a shot just to, you know, do what, what you need to do to just live your independent life that you want to live like, like everybody does. So we're just, we're really enthusiastic and we're looking forward to, to making this uh, making this happen, yeah. Giving me your own Thanksgiving, I was thankful and grateful enough already. When all this started, just to be a guest on your show. You know? I know. How do you like that? People wait six months for this opportunity. <laughs> so, Angela, if you just go to underneath wheelchair equipped van for Pete Sobe, back it, that allows you to make a donation of any amount. You know what? I wish I could offer somebody would just give the forty thousand dollars. I'd cook for them for a month. Let them, I'd even let them live with me so that I can help them. But I don't know if Charles would like that so much. Otherwise, you know? yourself oh. into, what is that? The Robert Redford, Woody Harrelson, Demi Moore movie? You're oh, wow. indecent, indecent Proposal. Oh, so. You might be approaching Charles like, Charles, your wife offered $40,000 to live <laughs> for a month. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and we kept them pretty reasonable because we really were going to sell the whole entire, we had planned for uh, the holidays to sell the entire 13 episodes with the ebook of the TV show, which you can't get any place else for, for, for a hundred. So we're doing that at 50, hoping that people will want that perk. So yeah, well, let's just keep our fingers crossed guys. And if you can't donate, at least consider sharing this. And, you know, Gina says she's going to ask for this for her holiday gift that somebody donates this. So that's the coolest thing. Yeah. Hi, Gina, by the way, I miss you. Thank you for watching, Gina. Oh, that's so cool. Well, Pete, you know, you really are an inspiration and hopefully people will share this so that other people can see there. And you, you want the donation site. It's, it's, I'm posting it in the, sh in the chat right now and I'll post it in the show notes the as show soon notes. as it's over. So, so yeah, it'll be in the show notes when at the end when the video is over and, and yeah, th that's something that you can post in Facebook or social media or wherever you want yeah. to post. And yeah. remember, if you donate, you'll, it'll be so that Pete can drive a two ton van. He can't tie his shoes, but he can drive a van. Isn't that like one of my greatest ironies of life? I can't tie my own shoes, but I could drive a two-ton van. Yeah. So that's, yeah. There is nothing that he can't do. <laughs> All right. Well, Pete, keep in touch. Have a very happy Thanksgiving. I know you're going to our old apartment building, so that's funny. Yeah. That's right. He's seeing some friends in our old apartment building. It just happens to be right across from the park, so I'm going to just roll my wheelchair right on over there. <laughs> yeah. Well, happy Thanksgiving to you, Peter. And thank you for all you do, Pete. Happy Thanksgiving to both of you. I mean, um, it was so great to hear from you again, to ask me to do this podcast, and now to give me this incredible gift on Thanksgiving. I honestly, you know, how did I get so lucky? Thank you guys both so much. I don't know. Well, you, you are just wonderfully inspiring to so many people and we want you to be able to continue to do your work and your volunteer work and speak at Children's Hospital. And, you know, I don't think people realize that even though Pete can get transportation through something like access, it's not easy. It's not like you and I, where we can just call an Uber and a Lyft at any time and they'll be there in five minutes. If he has a need like to go to the doctor or to do his volunteer job, it's a big arduous process of reserving in advance. When he has his own van, he, he doesn't have to be dependent on other people. He can just go, you know? So, and, and it's amazing to me how like they even equip it so that you can, I mean, there's another video in the Indiegogo campaign actually showing how you drive. Yeah, yeah, and there, we can attach links to that too if people want to see it. Absolutely, all right. Well, thanks so much, Pete. It's great catching up with you. Happy right. yeah.
And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please do consider sharing this campaign with everyone that you know. And do come back tomorrow at the special time of 9 a.m. when my guest is none other than New York Times bestselling author and PBS star Dr. Joel Furman, who will be talking about obesity and cancer. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Say happy Bye Thanksgiving. Bye now.